This is Watkins. Welcome with Bridget Fetessy. I'm Bridget Fetessy, and you are welcome. <laughs> <laughs> You know the drill. Please subscribe, rate, comment, share, reach out, tell your friends, send smoke signals, whatever. We love your feedback and we want to hear from you. This week on the podcast, I'm excited to have Ben Shapiro back on. Ben Shapiro, for those of you who live under a rock and don't know, is the founding editor-in-chief and editor emeritus of The Daily Wire and the host of The Ben Shapiro Show, the top conservative podcast in the nation. A three-time New York Times best-selling author, Shapiro is a graduate of Harvard Law School and an Orthodox Jew. He is widely considered one of the most influential conservative voices in America, and we sat down to talk about his new book, The Authoritarian Moment, as well as our love of California. Hi, Ben. Hey, how's it going? Good. How are you? Oh, my kids are exhausting me. <laughs> You're out of California. How does it feel? It is Definitely a good thing. So your your stress level drops about twenty five percent the minute you leave the borders of California. I was it's wondering like, about this. It, it's 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 totally true. I mean, like, first of all, in California, there's just this weird feeling, like every especially with the masking right now. There's this weird feeling, like everybody's just on your ass all the time, right? Yeah. Like you just you, you walk like we visited Sacramento and you walk around to establishments and. People, it, it, like, if you're not wearing the mask, people are giving you the glares and the dirty looks. And that's kind of writ large what politics is like in California. Like, among your social group, you're tolerated. But then if you're out in public at a party, it's like, oh, got to be careful what I say. And yeah. if you go anywhere else in the country that's not New York or Chicago, maybe, then everybody's like, okay, well, maybe we disagree, but that's okay. We're allowed to disagree. That's fine. Yeah. And I'm walking around Florida. Some people are masking. Some people are not. I would say the majority of people at this point are definitely not masking. Mm -hmm. And if you choose to wear a mask, nobody's, you know, yelling at you. And if you're not masking, nobody's yelling at you. It's like, wow, people actually treat each other like human beings over here. And I, I think some of that is politics and some of that is just the nature of being in, in big cities. So I'm, I'm in suburbia here in Florida. I'm not, you know, directly in the middle of a major city. But in California, I, I noticed this a long time ago in, in L.A. where I grew up. If you're walking down the street and you are you know, walking down the sidewalk, somebody else is coming in the opposite direction and you meet eyes, your first move is always to look away, right? Because it's, yeah. it's almost like <laughs> eye contact is insulting and weird yeah. in L.A. So I would say, you know, 15 years ago, I was visiting Oklahoma City for something. And I was walking down the street and some lady was coming the other way. And we locked eyes. And I did the L.A. thing of looking away. And she goes, hey, how are y'all? And I was like, whoa, what just happened? I'm so yeah. confused. And that's kind of every day outside of California. Just people say hello to each other. People are nice to each other. There's a certain baseline level of human treatment that you receive just for being a human. So that's very helpful. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like me, li like, first of all, the Jewish community that I live in is, is quite wonderful. I had a good community in LA, but it was, it was an island of, you know, religious community surrounded by people who really did not like any of those values. And in Florida, my religious community doesn't have values that are all that different from sort of the mainstream. And so you're just not looked at weird. So it's, right. it's, it's much more, it's much more comfortable. Plus no homeless problem. Right. Very clean. I can let my kids play on the street without me watching them. Uh, they can take their bike to friends' houses where we live. It's it's pretty great. I mean, it's it's sort of what you were promised when you were growing up, but that it was going to be like for your kids. I, did, I I was promised it's the vision that you had when when you were a yeah. kid of what like you could let your kids leave for two hours and not really worry about them. And that, that's that's where I live now, which is great because before, if I, I let my kids out the front gate of our house, there were at least twenty five percent shot be a heroin addict out front shooting into his feet. Yeah. That's one of the things I've noticed leaving is my nervous system seems to calm down just immediately. And I don't think I'm aware of how much stress I'm under just walking my dog. And every single time I walk my dog, I have to reroute because there's a crazy homeless person that I need to avoid. Or it just feels, I think I underestimate how dangerous it feels kind of constantly. And Watching the city, I mean, you've been, you were born and raised here and I've been here for almost two decades and watching it deteriorate, I think you have to have a level of like close your heart a little bit to even be able to manage seeing that amount of human suffering just everywhere on the streets all around you. Well, for sure. And it, it tends to actually make you kind of reactionary, right? Because mm -hmm. on the one hand, it's like, look at these people who are suffering, right? Living literally in their own feces, open needles. Uh, you know, pooping on the streets. And many of them are mentally ill. Many of them are drug addicts. I know we're not supposed mm -hmm. to talk about that with regard to the homeless. We're supposed to pretend that they're just free spirits who are living on the street <laughs> because 
they were because they couldn't afford the rent. But the reality is that a lot of these people have severe problems and leaving mm-hmm. them out to live on the street is an act of cruelty. It is not an act of kindness. And, and so you're, you're balancing that with the fact that in California, because a lot of these people have problems, you could be walking down the street and somebody could attack you. I mean, oh, yeah. I, I have friends to whom this has happened. There have been very publicized story about this happening on the streets of Los Angeles. And so on the one hand, it's like, I'm sympathetic to your plight as you sleep on this park bench. On the other hand, I don't want to walk too close to that park bench because I don't know who you are and what you're about to do to me. And yeah, so no. none of that is a solution. I know it's definitely it's a very strange feeling of terror and compassion trying to balance those two. And I went with Schellenberger. We went to down to Venice when they were clearing some of the houses out, like the homeless out of Venice. And then we went down to Skid Row and it was like the drastic difference in those two places. It does feel on the West Side, particularly in Venice, like a kind of lifestyle like yes. people who are just kind of like LARPing. There's a lot of mental illness. And then the Skid Row, I mean, it's massive. It's 47 blocks now. That's crazy. Or, and, no, and, it's and, bigger than that. But there were 47 families on Skid Row, they were saying. Families yeah. with children. That, it yeah, was, it's insane. It's First of all, I don't know how it's not child endangerment to literally be living on the street with children. Like, so CPS will show up at your home if you don't believe in trans pronouns. But, <laughs> yeah, but if you're living on the street in open filth, then apparently that's totally fine. And And- L.A. also allowed, you know, to happen what they had not in the 1990s, which was these these have been endemic problems in L.A. for a very long time, but they did not allow it to escape particular areas. So there was Skid Row in L.A., and that's been there for pretty much as long as I've been in L.A., yeah, right? Which it's just 30 huge years. now. But it was it was they, they allowed it to spiral out of control and then they allowed it to invade the suburbs. So where I was yeah. living in L.A. was like pure suburbia, right? I was not living yeah. in a commercial area. I was not living in downtown L.A. I was living in like North Hollywood area. We're semi close to a grocery store, but otherwise it's a pretty heavy residential area. And it didn't matter. You're still seeing homeless people walking up and down your street every single day. I mean, we had we literally had incidents where there, there was one time we walked out the front door of our house, which is a pretty nice house, and we opened the gates and literally across the street there's just a guy lying face down in the sewer, yeah. like Edgar Allan Poe. And yeah. you're like, this is not like I wouldn't let my wife walk around outside in these circumstances at dusk, right? It just yeah. it would not be a safe situation for her. I certainly wouldn't let my kids do that. And meanwhile, here I am in Florida and I'm like, I don't care what time it is. My kids want to take their bike around the cul-de-sac and joy. Like there, there's really yeah. no problem here. Yeah. And you've been pretty adamant, it seems lately about people getting out of these cities. Yep. You know, people who are like my husband and I wrestle with this. And I guess my question is, we have family here. I know you have family here. How do you kind of see that process unfolding. So if, you know, if everybody just leaves who is even moderate or normal or sane from these from these blue cities and states. I mean, the way I see it unfolding is the same way it's going to unfold, only you don't have to suffer. <laughs> if, I, <laughs> if, I, if I thought these states were purple, maybe I'd have a little bit of hope that you stick around, you fight it. But in California, right. it's two to one Democrat. And in LA, it's 1000 to one Democrat. So what exactly are you doing? Like you're just waiting yeah. around to be the the person who they suck the tax money out of to fund all of their garbage projects. So, you know, I, I understand the family issue for sure, right? We we still have some extended family. My wife has has siblings in LA. I have a sibling in LA. Um, but my parents came with us, so we're lucky, right? And oh, so that's great. My my parent we've lived near my parents literally our entire marriage because having a strong support network, particularly when you have kids, is very important. My wife was in it medical is. residency when we first had kids. Uh, and so having my parents nearby was always a big thing. And so when I said to my parents, we're moving to Florida, they were they literally flew with us on the same plane, bought a house at the same time. Uh, oh, and wow. so it's very, you know, that was great. That was very convenient. They're over all the time helping with the kids, enjoying the kids. It's a great, I mean, if you're going to retire, retire to Florida, man. Uh, so yeah. that's, that's, really, <laughs> that's really terrific. But just on a personal level, the argument that I made to my wife and that really was the best argument was this place has no trajectory. Like if you think it's bad now, wait five years. It ain't getting better, right? They're not yeah. fixing this place. It's just going to get worse. And you can be the person who's left holding on, telling yourself that this time Larry Elder will win the recall. Or <laughs> you can be the person who does not waste five to 10 years ensconcing your kid in a social network they're then going to have to leave in five or 10 years. And right? one yeah. of the keys about moving is, I said to my wife, not only are we paying exorbitant taxes for no public services, which clearly was true, but, but also, you know, our kids are going to make friends. They're going to be part of a social circle. And then what are you going to do? Wait five years and do this? So now yeah. our daughter's 10 or 11 or 12 and she's got yeah. a bunch of friends and now we're leaving. That's a lot harder than we move out here when my daughter is six and she's just entering the social circles. She gets to make all of her friends, be friends with them for her entire, you know, for her entire childhood. 
My son, same thing. My baby daughter is baby. So she's going to yeah. be Floridian as long as she can remember. You know, that's like now's the time to do it. So, you know, in your own personal situation, I think you have a few years, but I don't think you have many. I, I don't think that. No, if we you're, don't. Yeah, I, I think that you should you should be like I'm telling everyone to look to move. I don't yeah. understand why you're staying in a deep blue state. It's it's like all they, they also made all the good things about California bad. I know. So this, this was the main pitch that I so my wife was very anti moving like four years ago even three years ago. So four years ago, I started looking at the taxes I was paying. And I said to my wife, like, this is not sustainable. And she's like, well, yeah, you're paying a lot of taxes, but you make a lot of money, so that's okay. I'm like, okay, it's not a, it's not a horrible argument. Like, there's something, <laughs> there's something, you know, horrifying to me about signing a massive check to a government that I think is doing all the wrong things every year. Yeah. But at least the, the argument that, you know, we're not desperately in need of that extra cash is true. Although when I spelled out to her, like, you understand over the course of the next 20 years how much money we're going to just give to this garbage government that would be going into charity or into investments for the future or into the Kids Trust Fund, right? Like, right. Like that, that's, that's a lot of stuff that we could be using the money for better purposes than for Gavin Newsom enjoying himself at the French Laundry. You know, they, <laughs> but she was still kind of anti because, again, she had family over there, more family than I do because her, par her parents probably will end up moving here too. But what really got her was, the, was last year. So beginning of last year, they lock everything down because of the pandemic. We had just had a baby. Like she had, uh, we had our last baby. Uh, it would have been March 4th of last year. And then they shut down everything in California. I think it was March 15th of last year. Mm -hmm. So she made it in just under the wire. They shut wow. everything down. We're locked in the house. Can't go anywhere. They close all the parks. They close all the turnoffs off of Mulholland. Right? Like everything yeah, was, was closed. Crazy. It was insane. You couldn't go. Yeah. They literally were like, you can't go outside. If you're walking around, you have to walk around and keep six feet distance from people who are walking in the opposite direction or mask. Right? They closed and so, the beaches. Right, they closed the beaches. <laughs> they they put sand huge. all over the skate parks, like insane, yeah. right? Totally crazy. And so there's no place to go with the kids. And so we're locked down on our compound, basically, with the kids, not being able to see friends, not being able to see neighbors, not being able to have our kids do play dates, right? None of that. Yep. Because also my parents are 65, and so I, I understand, like I'm being careful. But it becomes pretty clear pretty quickly that outdoor activity is not bad. And also mm -hmm. that if you pod, it's not the end of the world. And also that this is not affecting kids, right? By, by like mm -hmm. June of that year, you knew this. Certainly by May, like by May, June, this was all, like known. And they were locking it down anyway. And then honestly, the breaking points were the riots. We got, to, yeah. we got to May and the riots over Floyd broke out at the end of May. It was May 31st. And suddenly the entire public health establishment is like, go out and party and twerk for Floyd. I go, know. And, and <laughs> I was like, this is not public health. Like this is just bullshit. And not only is it just bullshit, you're telling me, You've locked me down in my house for months. You told me I can't go to work. You've told my wife that she can't go to work. You've told us that we can't have a nanny, right? Because the nanny might be taking the bus. And so yeah. we have to, and my wife is like freshly given birth, right? So she's still having pain issues. And yeah. we have to lock down. And then you tell everybody they can go out and party in the street for George Floyd. And let's face this, for a lot of people, that was not a protest, it was a party. And yeah. for some people, it was a protest. For some people, it was definitely not a protest. It was an opportunity to go outside and hang out with other people. Because when you lock people who are 20 in their homes for, for months, they want to go out and do something. And when you tell them it's socially just, they're 100% going to do it. So you get yeah. hundreds of thousands of people in the streets protesting for George Floyd. Simultaneously, you get the riots and them telling yep. you, we are going to shut down Rodeo Drive at 1 p.m. so that we can allow people to run roughshod through Rodeo and break windows. Yeah. And, you're, and you're told, I mean, we were curfewed. You remember, they, they said yep. at 6 p.m., stay in your home. Okay, and meanwhile, I'm hearing <laughs> gunshots. Right, well, we're, we're not in a terrible area. We're hearing wild. gunshots. There's helicopters. They're hitting the Walgreens half a mile one way and they're hitting the Foot Locker yeah. half a mile the other way. And my wife turned to me and she was like, okay, we can visit Florida. <laughs> and so yeah. we visited Florida. <laughs> and the first thing that happened is we stepped off the plane and it was clean. There were no homeless people <laughs> and there wasn't garbage everywhere. And the streets were well kept and it was green. And there was no water shortage because of the dumb water management in California. And we're staying in a place where people are stopping by and saying hello to each other. And even though yeah. people are still being a little cautious and sometimes wearing masks, they haven't shut the outdoor restaurant. So I can take my wife out to dinner for the first time in three months, right? Because we're yep. eating outdoors and I can take my parents out to lunch for the first time in three months. They kept all the activities open. You had to wear a mask, but you could still go to the activities. All the parks were open. And so we're here for like a week and a half. And I said to my wife, we need to start looking for a place. And so we looked at like a bunch of houses. One, this is kind of funny, one of, the, one of the people who was selling his house who's off market. And so we went to his house and he said, I want X price for the house. And I said, okay, and that's above market. He said, right, but if you don't give me the price, I'm just not selling the house, right? Like, it wasn't on the market. I can live here uh -huh. forever. I don't care. And so we heard from the real estate agent there was somebody else going to make a bid. My wife and I were in the car together with the kids. 
the, the agent calls. He says, somebody else is probably going to make a bid on the house. Do you want it? And I said, let me get back to you. I hung up the phone. My wife and I are talking for literally 20 seconds. And my wife's like, do you want to put a bid in the house? I said, yeah, I think, I, I think I, we, we should. And she gets out of the car with the kids to do something. And I call up the agent. I'm like, just give him what he wants. She gets back in the car. She says, so should we put a bid on the house? And I was like, um, that ship has sailed, my friend. <laughs> like, it, it, is, it is a little late now. So we, we bid on a house while we were here. My parents bid on a house while they were here. We, we both had secured houses by the time we left. And then my wife was like, maybe we should wait around for a year and we'll transition. And I said, we're not doing any of that. Like, yeah. we, let's get the kids in school. It'll work out great, actually, because of Zoom school. So the kids would Zoom for a month before we moved because we couldn't get there till October and school started September. But they could do Zoom school so they could still meet all their friends and, their, and, and the teachers. Kids transitioned right in. They were in school the entire year. No wow. problem. And honestly, I have not thought for one moment, not one iota of a second about moving back to California. It's like not even a consideration. I'd have to be a fool to do it. They basically paid me a lot of money to move out of a worse state to a better state. <laughs> that's, that's a pretty good deal. Yeah. My husband and I were walking when we were we were laughing about how only in California could you be locked down while be on curfew while you were locked down. Right. It was like this insane thing. Double, double secret probation. Yeah. And we it, were walking during like one of the curfews and we're like, we we do. I feel like we need a sign. He we're only here because he has to finish his licensing for his therapy. Yeah. And if he moved, he would have to start over again. And it's just it's 3000 hours. I can't ask him to do that as much as I tried and may, maybe wanted to. But he we're walking and there's I'm like, we need a sign. And all of a sudden this it was like a news van drives by and it has a cab <laughs> spray painted on the side of it. And it was like all messed up. I was like, what are we doing? <laughs> we need to get out of here. Look at this place. So are you guys was, considering leaving? Because you should. No, we're leaving. We just, he has to be licensed because it's much easier to transfer a license it. than it is to, if we moved, he would have to start over. Right, right, right. So I where, mean, where are you looking? Maybe he could find a place. Um, Florida, Texas, yeah, and Tennessee. All yeah, all the basically. places. All the places. Yeah. Yep, yep. yep. And I mean, we listen. love Tennessee. My my aunt and uncle who are from here were just actually they went to your backstage thing. Oh, fun. And they were just visiting Tennessee. And my aunt was like, everyone's so warm and everyone's so friendly. And the yep. South is just so different. And it's true. It's true. I mean, the people are much nicer outside the big cities. Yep. It, and you understand, I mean, in the big cities, again, the threat assessment, like your your lizard brain threat assessment in big cities is, is on all the time because you just don't yeah. know so many people and you see so many people. But in these other places, you can create your own kind of local community where you know everybody. Yeah. And you're going to like local establishments, local yeah. churches, right? The local, like localism, you, when you're in California, like growing up in California, you never think about federalism. It's right. like you really <laughs> never think about it. You never think about like California versus the federal government because California was just a mimic of the federal government. And then you go to a state where people actually care about localism and federalism becomes a major issue. You're like, oh, right. okay, I, I see why. Localism actually matters. And so if you're in New York or California, I think there's just a completely different mentality with regard to the federal government. Because the federal yeah. government is just New York or California, but big. And right, when you're, it's true. When you're outside of those places, it's like, no, this is a very, very different place. And I don't want those people running my life. I don't want those people running my state. Like you, yeah. you, you can see why there's this whole conversation about, you know, should we be separate? Co like, look, we're not going to be separate countries. There's not a way to facilitate that. <laughs> Even if you wanted to be separate countries, it's, it's kind of silly talk on a practical level. But on an ideological level, it is true that the divide is really massive right now and massive in some really negative ways for the blue states. And I tweeted, I, I tweeted this morning about, you know, how I think that the big gap in American life right now is about the, the assessment of risk and how people assess yeah. risk. And I, I, I really think that's that. what it is. What do you attribute? I mean, there's so many questions I want to ask you about this. One, one I want to circle back to, which is about the medical institutions. How do you restore credibility and moral authority to the public health officials that lost so much of it over the pandemic and George Floyd and all of that? I mean, honestly, it, I think public health officials should not be recommending policy. I think public right. health officials should be like your, your doctor, right? Give you the risk factors of particular policies and then your decision. Right? When you and, go to your doctor, your doctor will say, I think that you need a surgery. And right. maybe you trust your doctor enough that you go, okay, let's do it. Or maybe you say, I need a second opinion. But your doctor right. doesn't say, I'm mandating that you get a surgery. <laughs> right? That's just the way it's going to be. Like, no one does that. What the doctor will say, I mean, doctors are legally bound to tell you about the risks of surgeries, right? Because of liability. So they'll tell you, like, 
look, this, the risk is minor, but X, Y, and Z could happen. And then it really is just a, a trust game. But our public health officials haven't earned any trust. And then they come out and they'll say, like, everyone must mask up. Mm-hmm. Not, not should, must, right? It's important. We should be pushing local mask mandates or we should be pushing vaccine mandates. And it's like, well, I, I no. I mean, that's not right. your job. That's really not your job, right? This is why you elect political officials. Political officials are designated in order to balance competing interests. That's literally why we elect them. I, I want somebody that is answerable to me making the decision as to whether you need to balance public health with the economy and how that balance works. I yeah. don't want somebody who's unelected and knows nothing about economics and doesn't care about economics and it's not inside their purview making that call, right? Yeah. Single factor analysis is one of the worst things that, that you can use when it comes to making public policy. And yet that's exactly what we did during the pandemic. It was like, public health will now be in charge because it's a pandemic. It's like, well, yeah. no, you still need to balance all of these interests and then determine, is there a midpoint? What kind of personal liberty do you allow? And instead it was like, well, we will categorize this as a public health problem. Therefore, a public health expert will handle it. And yeah. the problem is that it's not just a public health problem. It's an economic problem. It's an interpersonal problem. For many people at this point, it's a psychological problem. Like there are a lot of problems that are coincident here. And simply flattening it out to public health problem, go get Anthony Fauci and ask him what he wants to do is really bad policy. Or Barbara Ferrer or whatever her oh my name God. is. Yeah, exactly. Who has as yeah. much of a scientific background as I do. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the my husband and my sister-in-law both work with the teen population, teen girls in particular. And they were telling me stories about how all the parents were saying these kids were kind of messed up. And then post lockdown, everything just exponentially got worse. And my sister-in-law is in a public school system. And she she was like, I had somebody 10 minutes before the bell rang, came to the nurse and said, you know, I'm having suicidal ideation. And then we have to call a social worker. And she's like, that was the fourth one in the day. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's crazy. Well, we, we've completely shifted. I mean, so human beings are entirely adaptable. Like, well, this is kind of our, our special superpower, right? This is what Brett and Heather talk about, Brett, yeah, Brett Weinstein yeah. and, and Heather Hying. Our superpower is that we are very, very adaptable as creatures. But that also means that we adapt very easily to being enervated, right? So when the entire situation says to you, stay home and stay there and we'll take care of you, people adjust to that really quickly. But there is one group of people in our society that are not particularly adaptable, and that's teenagers. Teenagers are really not adaptable. Teenagers, their brain is still developing. They have not developed into who they're going to be. So they they adapt in certain ways, but they really don't adapt. In other ways, they have many more needs psychologically than than fully grown adults because when you're fully grown, you can use things like, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy because you have a fully formed prefrontal cortex, right? There's part of your brain that turns out that that you can say no with, right? Right. Or that you can try to think through your problems with. When you're a teenager, that part of the brain is almost non-functional, right? It is just your lizard brain functioning all the time. And so when your lizard brain is is reacting to being locked in a cage for hours a day and your only outlet being online. nasty people online, yeah. that is that is human beings were not adapted to this. I mean, it's yeah. and, and so like your brain is not made for that. And the part of your brain that needs to be operational at that point is the prefrontal cortex. And that's the part of the brain that apparently so many people have turned off. They were saying at my sister-in-law's place, they had a whole meeting and they were talking about just the rising suicide rates with teenagers. And these seem like things that people mentioned and talked about and worried about. And now that you're actually seeing these numbers, there's no talk or... Yeah, be quiet, be quiet. No, you're undermining the public health authorities. You get this a lot with, with kids and masking also, right? So for years, yeah. it has been accepted psychological knowledge that little children need to see faces. Right? This, has yeah. been, this has been known forever. My wife used to work in a neuroscience lab. She's done a bunch of neuroscience papers. And this is specifically what they researched was the impact on small children of not seeing faces. Right? This is why mm. if you have orphanages in the third world and those orphanages don't have enough adult interaction, the kids grow up really you know, screwed up in, in upsetting ways. You need little kids to see faces. They need to have human interpersonal interactions. This is the, They learn mirroring. I mean, you literally yep. have functions as a human being that are present in primates Mirror functions, yeah. right? This mirror is how you neurons. learn how, what kind of yep. faces to read and how you actually identify all of that. And all of that just went out the window. You weren't supposed to mention any of that because masks are inherently good. And not only that, you can do it indefinitely. This should be the new normal now. And it's like, this is why I, I keep coming back to, you know, what I said earlier, the country is now splitting between people who are completely risk averse and believe that th- there are systems that will always take care of them and people who are kind of risk seeking and are willing to live their lives. And Sometimes that breaks down in negative ways for the risk-seeking, right? Maybe they don't take risks seriously enough and so you get higher infection rates and more COVID deaths. But in other ways, 
it breaks down the opposite, right? If you are a person who believes that the government is going to take care of you no matter what and all risks should be alleviated, you're giving an awful lot of control to a very small coterie of people to tell you what to do. That's going to mean less entrepreneurship. It means less planning for the future because planning for the future is inherently a risk-taking activity, right? You're pregnant, you're going to have a baby. You're planning for the future. That's a risk-taking activity, right? Yeah. That is, because you are, you are right now foregoing particular things that you could be doing in favor of future benefits, yeah. right? You're absorbing risk. That's what, that's what, building for the future means. If I invest in a bond or if I invest in a stock, that is me foregoing pleasure in the here and now, the money that I'm spending in favor of a payoff down the road, right? That's, that's, that's me allocating risk. If you say, I'm never going to take a risk, what you end up with is a completely stagnant society. And I think that is the, the great gap in American society right now, a stagnant society that sees that the, the great goal ought to be redistribution because that's the only thing that you can do in a stagnant society is you can have everybody be more equal if if more miserable. Yeah. Or you can be in more innovative society where it's not about redistribution. It's much more about risk-taking and rewarding risk-taking that is positive and punishing risk-taking that is negative and creating incentive structures for all of that. There's a reason, like, I keep coming back to the stat and no one wants to talk about it, which is insane to me. The United States has 50 states, right? I mean, like, these are great little labs of democracy. You right. can tell which policies worked and which ones didn't. You can compare. Like, it's a great sociology experiment. All of this has been. And some of it's been done on the public health level where it shows that, for example, mask mandates have not been particularly effective. Some of it has been done with regard to social distancing. Some has been done with regard to vax rates and all of that. But one area where it's been completely done is with regard to the impact of your attitude on COVID and regulations that you've undertaken with regard to economic policy. I cannot get over the fact that while the left likes to talk about the striation of COVID death by the number of COVID deaths, really not even by per capita, because per capita, it's a little messier, but number of COVID deaths by red versus blue or vaccination rates by red versus blue. They never yep. want to talk about economic success by red versus blue. Because mm. if you look at the worst places in America, economically speaking right now, the ones with the highest unemployment rate, the nine states with the highest unemployment rate plus DC, all blue. Okay, then if you look at the 23 states with the lowest unemployment rates, 17 are red, four are purple, two are blue. Right. That is not a coincidence. Right. Yeah, that's that's what's really been interesting for me to observe is this little mini authoritarian that was triggered. And it's that seems like the split to me, the people who are, are live and let live and make your own choices, take your risks. You're all adults. And then people who are just OK with telling people what they should put in their body, for instance, and mandating these things and to, and demanding that people all get in line and behave and to come back to your book. I, I think that this authoritarian, like you said, that we're, we're susceptible to accepting it, but it seems like we're also susceptible to being little mini penny, petty oh, tyrants. Absolutely. Well, I mean, again, I think that does come down to what's the best way to avert risk. The best way to avert risk is to tell everybody else around you what to do because right. it, it, you're, you're sometimes a risk to yourself, which means that you need somebody to tell you what to do. But more often <laughs> right. you tend to think not that way. And right? more often people tend to think, well, I'm good. Right? I'm rational. I make good decisions. But these jerks around me, they make terrible <laughs> decisions like all the time. And what I would really like to do is delegate power to this person up here who just tells everybody what to do. And if they do that, then I am really, really safe. Right? And we do this on every level, right? So economically speaking, over the last two years, and really over the last 40, we've delegated so much power to, for example, the Federal Reserve and the Treasury Department. It's insane. Right. Nearly yeah. all monetary and fiscal policy is no longer done in Congress. It's now almost entirely done by the Federal Reserve. Right. It is their job to make sure unemployment is low and inflation is low. And it's just a it's just a bunch of guys sitting there like moving the numbers around, predominantly guys, maybe a couple of women. But it's mostly, you know, just this very small coterie of people who are just manipulating numbers at the top levels of the American government <laughs> or, you know, yep. the supposedly independent Federal Reserve. That's risk aversion. That's you saying, I wish that we, we, you know, we can't have the possibility of downturns in the future. So I will delegate all this power to this small group of people. Now, the thing is that that also means they can shut down the economy for a year and a half. Right. And they can lie to you that they're going to fix all your problems. And they can create <laughs> perverse incentives where they mitigate risk on the one end, but it ends up blowing up in ways that they didn't expect, which was the 2007, 2008 story, right? We will we'll give the Federal Reserve and the regulators enormous power to set mortgage rates, to create subprime mortgage tools, to to inflate the currency. We'll 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 use QE to continue stimulating the economy. And then there's this huge risk that nobody's paying attention to, which is that people are going to default on their mortgages and right. it just collapses the entire system. There's no, this is the thing, risk is unavoidable, but you can pretend that risk is avoidable so long as you have, like all human beings have this desire for control, right? This is what we do as human beings. We try to control our environments. 
Well, what yeah. happens when your environment includes other humans? Well, how do you control those people? Now, a normal person says the limits of my control are within this purview, right? Like literally arm's length. That is the limits yeah. of my control. But that is something that has to be bred into you because the normal human instinct is, what if I were the one operating control or somebody who agrees with me operating control? Because then I could control my entire environment. Then I control yeah. everyone around me. And that's exciting stuff. Yeah, it seems it's so weird, though. I guess coming from the left and being being a liberal, being like a hippie and a, a free spirit, it's not what I expected. You know, I would ex I wouldn't have expected that the conservatives in this moment were the ones who were less risk averse and that the the left was the ones who were trying to make sure everything was safe and, and obsessed with safetyism. And I feel like a lot of this process was already happening, you know, but the stuff we're seeing now, obviously, and you talk about this in your book, I think many moderates fail to see the huge threat posed by the left that I saw this writing about why I was politically homeless coming from the left. And people were like, what are you talking about? It's not even the same. And I'm I was always a lot more terrified just because of the institutional power they have. And you talk about how it's a small minority, but it doesn't feel that way when every institution is in lockstep. Right. And again, that, that, that I keep coming back to the risk aversion thing because I really think it is. So many of these institutions, some of them are dominated by people who are true believers, right? The universities are true believers. Some of the media are true believers, right? The Nicole Hannah-Jones contingent to the New York Times. But there are a bunch of people who are not true believers. The corporate heads are not true believers. And I don't think that Zuckerberg at Facebook or even Dorsey at Twitter, who's closer to it, and certainly not the heads of Coca-Cola or at and Like, these people are not true believers. No. Like, the, the head of American Airlines, not a true believer. They're just afraid, right? And, and right. This, is, this is the cowardice. You know, so my business partner, Jeremy Boring, is fond of saying, cowardice doesn't get you killed. Cowardice gets your friends killed. And that's, <laughs> that's right. I mean, because, and you see this all the time, is that you'll see corporations and they will cower and it doesn't get them killed. It just gets all the people who disagree with them who work at their company killed, right? Yep. Or, or it affects their stockholders in some way that they don't really care about. And, and so it's all about risk aversion. And you can see the decision tree for a lot of these corporate heads. And you can it, it's, it's so fascinating to watch how the decisions get made. So you have a group of people who are very loud and say they're going to boycott your product or give you bad press. And they're working in cahoots with the New York Times to feature you on the front page if you don't do X. And so you think to yourself, OK, fine, I'll, I'll do X. And then, they'll, and then they'll leave me alone, right? I'll just do it. And then they'll leave me alone. And then it turns out that there's blowback. And so right. your next move is, OK, well, I can't go back to being neutral because if I'm neutral, then I get hit by The New York Times, too. So the next move is to say that I'm in favor of what we will now call stakeholder capitalism, right? not shareholder capitalism, because my shareholders are pissed at me, stakeholder capitalism, where everyone who's affected by my business has, a, has, a, has something to say about the company and I will answer to them, which really means I'll answer to no one, right? Right. And, and so you, you get this consistent doubling down. This is why I say in the book, like, the right is going to have to use tactics that I don't like. Because mm. otherwise, the right is just going to lose. So the most obvious thing here is, you know, Jeremy and I, when we founded Truth Revolt, one of the things we, which was designed at going at companies and telling them not to advertise on leftist products, we said at the time, we don't want to do this. We think this is bad. But mutually assured destruction. There's only one worse thing than having nukes, and that's your opponent having nukes and you not. Right. right. So w if you want to, if you want these corporations to go back to neutral and advertise with everybody, for example, or perform the all-star game in Georgia or not speak out on whether a particular locality should have a transgender bathroom law, then you really need to pose a threat from the other side. Like the, the right, right for a long time has said, like, we don't like these tactics, so we won't use them. That's fun and games up until the left uses those tactics in order to completely hijack these institutions, get all of your friends fired, and then disinvest from the areas where, where you live, right? Yeah, I was having a dinner with Abigail Schreier, and I think it was the night I was radicalized <laughs> because she was talking about you know, her inbox is just yep. filled with parents and people and and all of our inboxes are filled, but hers in particular. Oh, yeah. And it gets dark on, on her end, I think, very yep. dark. But she was saying, you know, and you mentioned this too, just how good Americans and moderates and center right and people who are working and raising kids, they will go along to get along for the most part. And she's she was saying that they don't understand they're up against activists who are at this 24 seven and will never rest. And they're not, you can't just be on the sidelines really anymore. And I think a lot of Americans understand this because they've been dragged into even, I'm a great example of this, someone who is pretty apolitical and got dragged into 
this whole culture war, knowing very little about any of it. And you're like, what is going on? And she was, she really made me think about how it's true. You know, you can't just, you can't just sit silently because you will get bulldozed over eventually. Yeah, absolutely. And they, and they want to do it also in like the most private spheres of your life. That's the part that's yeah. truly crazy. I mean, what, what Abigail is talking about is the hijacking of, as a parent, your ability to say to your child, you are a member of the sex to which you were born. <laughs> right? That's what that's, that's I mean, literally what Abigail was talking about. Right. It's yeah. your kids, right? Like, and, and you and the society is now geared towards saying that you're a bad parent and maybe we will take your kid away from you. If you, yeah, if you say these things, which is totally insane. I mean, insane. Abigail's written about this stuff on Barry Weiss's site. You know, yep. she, she talked about the, the one that struck me was that case, I believe it was in Seattle, of the Muslim that father. That was the, when the state comes for your kid, that piece? Yeah, exactly. That, yeah. that, I mean, and by the way, I mean, I don't think you have to be a prophet to be, you know, predictive in this particular business. I've been predicting for literally years this was going to happen. I've been predicting yeah. for years that they were going to come for the kids, that the state was going to be mobilized against institutions they don't like. Like, this was the thing. The The original liberal pitch on a lot of this stuff was at least mildly understandable, and now it's just complete tyranny. So it went yeah. from, for example, just to take a perfectly obvious example, it went from on gay marriage, you should leave two people alone in their bedroom who want to do what they want to do if they're not affecting you. Good argument. Very good argument. Then it went to, okay, well, you know, we feel like we should be able to have the same contractual arrangements kind of as default as a straight couple when it comes to wills and trust. And you're like, well, I mean, theoretically, you could do that outside the bounds of law, but- Okay, I guess. And that's civil unions. Then it was, well, you know, we just want to be called married because after all, how does that affect you? It's not going to affect your life. I mean, if we get married, how does that bother you? And now you're starting to edge into, okay, you're changing fundamental institutions and, and redefinitions. And so it does affect general societal standards, but at least you understand the argument. And then it went to, if you don't bake the cake, we want you put out of business, right? <laughs> right. If you don't, if, if you send your kid to a school that does not teach the moral equality of all sexual relationships, this means that you're a bad parent and a threat to the society. And you go, whoa. So we went from leave us alone in our bedroom to we would like to control how you educate your kids and take away your kids from you if you don't educate them properly. That is a real move right there. I, I mean, I found a lot of hope in your book, actually. And one of the things that you said and, and wrote early in the introduction where you talked about how buried in authoritarianism is its insecurity. And I loved that. It's just like something I've, I've really clung to because I, I find that some days it gets very dark and I have no I'm very I have very little hope probably because I'm in California. Yeah, so no, really. I'm, it is a thing. I'm telling you, like it's a mental yeah. thing. If you spend all your time online and in a place where everyone disagrees with you, it makes it very difficult. And again, I'm not living in like red central. Yeah. Right? I mean, I, I live in South Florida, which is kind of purplish, right? The state of Florida is trending red, but it is not like fully red by any stretch yeah. of the imagination. I mean, I know a lot of people here who vote Democrat. I'm not living in West Virginia or, or living in Tennessee with, with the rest of the company. And yet- Everybody kind of treats each other like human beings. And yep. that is that is not the case in places like California, where you are literally looked at as, as almost subhuman if you disagree with certain <laughs> prevailing standards socially. Like if you say in public in California, like if you're, at a, if you're at a dinner party and the issues that Abigail is talking about comes up and you say, yeah, no, I believe that biological sex is a reality and that human beings are sexually dimorphous. The, the party will go silent. <laughs> People are like, you're a, you're, a, you're a bigot. You need to leave now. Yeah. It's like, whoa, what? Really? And the answer that's is yes. So, that's what's so crazy, too, to see these kind of mainstreamings of like Chappelle, for example. I, it, you saw this coming. I saw this coming two years ago. Yep. The kind of get, get Hannah Gadsby versus Chappelle is yeah, the real culture this, yep. war. And then you see now it's anyone who liked the Chappelle show, which is 10 million plus people who urged who liked the closer is a transphobe, basically. It's the same thing they did to J.K. Rowling. By the way, it's, it, you want to know something fascinating about that special. So Chappelle tells all these jokes that are supposedly transphobic, right? And everyone yeah. loses it. Like people, oh my God, what a bigot. He told two jokes in there that are pretty anti-Semitic, okay? Yeah, I know. Like, like he told, like his joke about space Jews, like if you know anything about Jewish history is like pretty full on anti-Semitic. Like the, yeah. the joke that, like the Jews voluntarily, I and mean, what he's saying is the Jews voluntarily left Israel and then came back in and decided to and our, subject the Palestinians to Holocaust-like treatment. Like, that's right. really bad stuff from a Jewish perspective. <laughs> you didn't see anybody from the Jewish community being like, God, we need to take Chappelle off the air. I was going to ask you about this because I didn't, I was laughing because I'm like, well, I think the Jewish population has a pretty good sense of humor in general. Yeah, we're but all like, I, okay, so I don't like the joke, you know? Yeah. Like, it's like, it's an, I kind of think it's an ugly joke, but 
he's a comedian. Like comedians tell yeah. ugly jokes. Like, all right, and and yeah. you know, like, first of all, for the people who know the history, they're not going to think it's funny. For the people who don't know the history, they're really not even going to understand the reference. So it's like, all right, what, whatever, you know. And and even if I disagree with the joke, okay, it's like, what what I want him to lose his job over it? Yeah, I'll just say I don't like the joke, and then we move yeah. on. But like the, the the people who are doing Netflix, like first of all, it's going to be wildly unsuccessful because you've picked too big a target. You can't. No one is going to cancel their Netflix over Dave Chappelle. Like you couldn't <laughs> even get enough conservatives to cancel their Netflix over Cuties. You're not going to get people to to cancel their Netflix over Dave Chappelle. It just ain't going to happen. Right. What gives you hope? Can you give one or two examples of people or institutions other than you guys? And, you know, obviously, I think my what I've noticed is that with moderate liberals, people who might be self-censoring, silent, afraid, the majority, it seems like they have to hear it from the right people sometimes. Yes. Yeah. Like N- Glenn I- Greenwald or Barry Weiss or the people who Agreed. came from these institutions. Agree. So, like I mean, I say I in the book, be, I say in the yeah. book that the hope of the country isn't going to lie on the right because we believe what we believe. And it's certainly not going to lie on the radical left who are trying to destroy everything. It's going to lie with the people on the center or center left who have to make a decision. The decision right. is they agree with the left on a lot of policy, but they disagree on sort of fundamental human rights and how we get there and how we should treat each other. So do they pursue utopia at the expense of those rights? Or do they say, okay, it might take us longer to get there, or maybe we'll never get there, but the rights have to be protected anyway. And yeah. that's that's a real battle. So you know, a lot of the people that we've been talking, like, Barry is an excellent example of somebody I disagree with on a lot of politics. In fact, I think with Barry, maybe the only things that we agree on are like foreign policy and wokeness. Those might be the only <laughs> things that Barry and I agree on. Um, uh-huh. But Barry is speaking to an audience that is, you know, needs to be activated. Uh, so right. Barry would be some people like John McWhorter writing for the New York Times, right? Who's sort of yep. like a traditional, I think, liberal Democrat, but who is not up for the wokeness and he's not up for the woke battles. Right? The, those folks starting to speak up gives me a lot of hope. Uh, there's yes. some university presidents who are, who are doing that sort of stuff. And again, what I'm seeing with the school boards right now gives me a lot of hope too. Like people who are realizing that this sort of policy is being baked in at the local level. And they realize I, I may not be able to challenge this if it gets to the federal level. So challenge it now. That, that gives me yes. a lot of hope as well. Even though they're domestic terrorists, Ben. The worst people. <laughs> the worst people. You know, only, only having I, their daughters allegedly raped in bathrooms. I, I don't know why that guy was upset. I mean, come on. I yeah. was saying the other day, it's not, it's, it's more terrifying to me, that kind of language, because it's, it, you know, everyone who disagrees with me is a Nazi became everyone who disagrees with me as a domestic terrorist, which you can actually prosecute, you know, the, yeah, the Patriot it's one Act. thing I mean, when you're literally like, oh. calling, yeah, they're, they're calling on people to use the Patriot Act at the DOJ to go after these folks. I mean, like, yeah. Okay. Uh, I mean, if you want to facilitate an American separation, that's the way that you're going to do it. Like what, what people ask me about the secession stuff all the time, because of these divides we're talking about. Yeah. And what I always say is that it's not going to go like a lot of people think it's going to go, right? Like we're not as a country going to be shooting our friends and neighbors. Like that's just not yeah. where we are as a country. And anybody who thinks that we are, I think is out of their mind at this point, nor should yeah. we be talking like that. But there will come a point where there is sort of a natural just no. And now what are you going right. to do about it? And it's I think that we're, we're quickly we're quickly approaching that point. I mean, it's I, I think governors are doing this to the feds right now. They're like, nope, we're just not going to do it. Yeah. Come in. Bring it. You know, you want to bring your feds down here and try and enforce this on 20 million Floridians? Like, enjoy. See how that works out for you. Right? Like, yeah. Texas, the same thing. And so, no is going to become an extraordinarily powerful word. And, you know, for my family and for my company, no was the word that meant we were getting the hell out of California. What gives you the most hope? That. I mean, really, like, that the people are going to make decisions with their feet. I think yeah. a lot of the stuff that people say to pollsters is not true. I think this, how they behave in their regular life is true. And, and people are moving to the, I think the big sword is a good thing. I think it's a very good thing. I think people, you know, that if we can't live with each other, then maybe we can live apart. And if we can live apart, then maybe at the federal level, we'll start realizing California doesn't want Texas to rule it and Texas doesn't want California to rule it. And maybe the only agreement we can come to is to let each other live on a state level the way apparently in California, they won't let you live on an individual level. <laughs> yeah. My last question is just, I know that I'm feisty on Twitter and you can be feisty. I have like a t-shirt that says you're not woke, you're annoying because I think the best way to deal with it is just to mock it instead of even giving it credibility. I'm like, it's not even a serious thing. And you have the leftist tears tumbler. At what point are we a part of the problem? You know, is I mean, wrestle with this at all or? (laughs) Yeah. I mean, listen, there's a reason why I try to have people who are on the other side on the show. Yeah. Like, the reality is we do live in a very polarized market and mm-hmm. I'm not going to pretend that I am neutral in that market. 
right? Mm-hmm. I'm very conservative. I have people I agree with. I have people I disagree with. Uh, the, the best that I can do is most of the time try and treat people who are on the other side with a baseline level of respect. I'm not going to apply that to politicians because I don't think nearly any politician deserves any respect at all. They work for me. <laughs> yeah. right? That's not the same thing. But, you know, when, when I do a debate, when I do a public you know, conversation with somebody, I try to treat people on the other side with respect and facilitate those conversations. But when it comes to ideas, I, I think that fighting hard-nosed battles over ideas, that's been going on since the beginning of the Republic. I think that's a good thing. I don't think that's part of the problem. Okay. My, my friend Dennis Prager, you know, he'll say that clarity before agreement, and I agree with that. I, I think clarity before agreement. Now, you can disagree without being wildly unpleasant, uh, and this is part of the marketing pitch, right? It's, it's, it's kind of a weird thing. If you ever watch any of the, you know, quote-unquote Ben Shapiro destroys videos, yeah. I never actually say anything mean to anybody. <laughs> right? If you actually watch those videos, like not, not just the headline, if you actually watch the video, it's like someone makes a point, I make a point, they don't have a great answer. Thug life music, right? Yeah. It, it's, it's never like I come out there and I'm doing, you know, a, a Trump where like, your wife's ugly and you're stupid. Right? Like that, mm-hmm. that's not, yeah. that's not a real thing. So I think that sort of stuff is not bad. I mean, like I, I recently did a debate with Anna Kasparian. It was- I saw some of it. Right. And it was like just normal and normal political conversation. And we disagreed and we weren't insulting each other. And I'm all for that sort of stuff. But I, I think that, you know, the, the climate is, uh, is not necessarily ripe for, for that sort of stuff. But I think passionate political debate is a good thing. I think treating it as a bad thing or like polarization is itself bad. Polarization over what is always the question. Polarization right. over issues is not necessarily a bad thing because if the opposite is a monopoly, a monopole, right? Like one perspective just dominating the other, I'd prefer polarization. But if what we're talking about is treating people like shit, I think it's a different thing. Right. Well, it's always a pleasure catching up with you. I appreciate your time. Where can everybody find you if they don't know, which would be shocking? Uh, Well, you can get my (laughs) podcast on any of the big podcast services, or you can check us out over at Daily Wire. And of course, you can follow my irreverent and uh, and frequently trended commentary over at at Twitter if you wish to waste hours of your day in unmitigated stupidity. You can head on over to Twitter. (laughs) But it's so fun. Oh, man. (laughs) Thank you, Ben. Thanks, Bridget. It's time for the weekly check-in with Bridget and Cousin Maggie. Do you live under a rock or are you just afraid to live? (laughs) (laughs) This is going to be my new. I was just talking to one of our future guests about how I want to start a master class on getting canceled. Oh. Even a fake satirical video series would be hilarious yes but you could probably still give some helpful tips (laughs) because you're always it's so funny to watch Bridget as she watches someone actively get canceled and be like oh they shouldn't have done that oh no that's not what you do I can't tell you how many people I've reached out to over the years Mm -hmm. tried to stop them from making everything worse but alas it feels like the momentum is definitely people saying go kick rocks to this kind of overwhelming. They're starting to be pushback. Yeah, I just think people have had it. Mm-hmm. You can only call people racist bigots for so long for the dumbest reasons of all time. Yeah, so much outrage <laughs> just leads to like people rolling their eyes. Yeah, you just get, oh, everybody's like got, and I think Americans right now all have oppositional defiance disorder. <laughs> like America, everyone in America is like a teenager. Hmm. Yeah. They're all like, nah. They're just tired. They're tired of being told what to do. They're tired of, they don't trust the institutions. Mm-hmm. If If they're on one side, they're going to fight the opposite side no matter what. Mm. Just to be defiant. I mean, it's wild to me to watch people on the left defending like big pharma that's crazy to me and like corporations and people are, i think are just so distrustful yeah it's almost like everyone in america is becoming gen x <laughs> and i think this is a good thing they're all like whatever yeah well whatever never mind yeah they're all approaching the exactly right place with which to handle the forthcoming apocalypse. (laughs) The impending apocalypse. This is the attitude you want. I'm sleepy. (laughs) (laughs) I've been sleepy all day. I I need a nap. I don't think you've gotten enough rest lately. Well, no, because I've been jet... I need my child to be used to jet setting. Well, she's got going to get used to it. 
I need my child to be a jet setter. Well, she eats nothing but filet and bone marrow. <laughs> <laughs> you got to watch Dumpster Fire to get that reference. And it's just been busy. I want to do media while I can. Yeah. Which is rapidly less and less appealing. Right. Well, it's getting, you know, it's we're headed into the holidays where you don't really want to travel. And pregnant dumpster fires are going to be hilarious. Yeah, when you're like really pregnant. <laughs> I'm looking forward to those. I'm Lord gonna... only knows. You're going to go crazy because you're going to be like, I'm pregnant. I can say whatever I, I don't want. Give a fuck. <laughs> I know. I already do feel much feistier than normal, which is already... Yes. Your baseline of feist is like 10 times what a normal person is. Well, Maggie's officially on full time. Yes, she is. It's taken two and a half months, <laughs> but finally we've rescued her from her her last job. It's time. Yep. It's very exciting. I'm so excited to just be able to focus on one thing. One of many things that we're focusing on. <laughs> well, you know, we've got a multitude of projects going on, but the focus is building the fetacy cul-de-sac into an actual empire. <laughs> it will be an empire someday. <laughs> Look, all I care about is a private jet. <laughs> <laughs> I know we were laughing about this the other day. I was like, you've had an obsession with flying private basically your entire life. Because <laughs> flying sucks. Even, Just... I mean, in our 20s when we were living where I live now, still near the Santa Monica airport where all the private jets live, every time we'd be on a walk and one would take off, she would like stop and turn and look at it and like jump up and down and be like, woo! I want one. I'd be like, someday I'm going to be looking down at the crazy girl in the park cheering for me. Someday. <laughs> yeah. I can see why there are so many private jets and all these things. No one wants to fly pleb lines. <laughs> <laughs> She's already losing her common touch, people. <laughs> I haven't even lost totally. my common touch. I just hate it. I, I'm tired of being a commoner. I want more in my life. I want to be where the private jets are. <laughs> yep. <laughs> it's my little merv. It's my time. It's, you're what, three years out of being a waitress and still. <laughs> She's already <laughs> like... It's private jet or nothing. <laughs> Three years after slinging my last plate of fries, and I'm like, where's my private jet? <laughs> and it's only because the rigmarole of flying is, it's you know what it ultimately comes down to for me is time, mm. which as you know for me, is the most valuable, precious commodity in the world. Yeah. And the amount of time it takes to like go fucking anywhere and go through the airport and do the thing yeah, and get to, to the place. There, like, an and then you and get dead, like and... delayed because every five flights are being canceled. And mm -hmm. and also flying with a mask is not comfortable. Although I was on my last flight from Dallas and the guy was coughing so much, I was like so grateful to have a mask on because mm. he was just like hacking and hacking and hacking. Mm. I, I don't mind the mask actually weirdly on flights because I find them disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> I just remember when I flew, when we flew home in, in the summer, I didn't mind the way out, but the way back I started to get, I started to notice how uncomfortable it was. Mm. But I'm also lucky that I don't have to wear a mask all day, n you know, normally, like that in my normal routine does not require although that makes you less sensitive to them like jaron when we were flying to south africa when we had to wear the mask for freaking literally like no joke i think it was probably 24 hours before we got to take our masks off maybe mm -hmm. more mm -hmm. um no it was like 48 mm -hmm. when we were flying there he was much more accustomed to it because he had to wear it all day at work and i hadn't had to wear it so i was like Right. Eight minutes in, I'm like, get this off. That's what I'm saying is I don't have to wear, like I was noticing it more because I'm not used to just wearing one. Oh, yeah. yeah. I thought you were saying you were feeling bad for people who did. No, I, I feel like Which they- Which I also they, you, do. Yes, I do. I do feel bad for that. But they, you get used to it and I feel like I'm, I was more aware of it than someone who has to wear one every day. It would, would have been. 
Well, yeah. Do you want to tell the people where you're going now? Well, I'll already. Oh, no, I guess I won't. Yeah, it'll be. I'm in New York. <laughs> That's where I will be. Now I'm going to New York. I'm going to New York because I'm doing Gutfeld, which will be tonight when this airs. Yeah, it will be Thursday night, the day that the podcast drops. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. At last, at last, I will be there. Yep. Apparently, Gutfeld is kind of a big deal. I live under a rock, so I have no idea. <laughs> it's not that big of a deal, I don't think, but he is like crushing it in late night. How do you feel about this? show going I have no idea what to expect yeah I think I used to care and worry a lot more about which way I would be perceived and like what people would think and now I just don't care people are gonna think whatever they want to think about me Mm -hmm. I will happily go on Stephen Colbert I'll happily go on on any of the left-wing news organizations but they don't ask me I have asked so many left-wing people to come on this podcast right constantly like socialists and they just won't either completely ignore me or will not come on so or will agree and then and they'll then all flake. say the irony is then they'll yeah or agree and then flake that's the that's the other one the irony is that like so many that they'll use that against you and be like oh well you're only on right wing media well you leave me no choice right you're not, you're not exactly having me on so right. that argument doesn't mean anything to me anymore mm-hmm I'm like, I know where I stand. I know who I am. I'm a very open-minded, curious person, but I'm certainly not a social conservative. Uh Uh-huh. You know, I'm not. And I think actually coming on the heels of being on Rogan and then particularly you are here two nights in a row with a guy who is a young social conservative and kind of battling with him Uh made me... A, more confident in just pushing back in those situations because that's a so, completely separate muscle and be more aware that I'm, if you listen to most of my appearances, you're like, yeah, that girl sounds like a libtard. Right. You you <laughs> can't, you got in the car and you're like, well, I've learned I'm still a lib. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If I learned anything on my trip to Texas, I was like, still a lib, still a lib. Still a lib at heart. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to. You know, he was like, are you embarrassed about your, like, boobs? And what are you going to, your nudie shots? And now that you're pregnant with a daughter? And I was like, I think it's an opportunity for me to have a conversation. And I made a really funny joke where he's like, well, what are you going to do or say? You know, and I was like, well, I hope that I raise her better than to put her boobs online. (laughs) (laughs) Ah, Which was fun. But... I don't know. I'm, I'm like, by the time that happens, oh my God. You're like, they're hot pictures of me. Why would I regret having them out I there? I mean, it's not <laughs> like there's, yeah, I just think that it's so far off. Yeah. So far off. I, that's assuming so many things. Mm-hmm. Like the world isn't going to end in five years. <laughs> mm-hmm. Or like that the internet will still exist by the time you need to have this conversation with your daughter. Yeah, or that like <laughs> I won't, be able to wipe the internet with my billions of dollars <laughs> have them scrubbed as you just live above the earth in your private jet <laughs> <laughs> circling the globe who knows i don't even have the baby yet it's uh, such a like i don't like to be so you know yeah. counting my chickens before they hatch yeah but yeah it was good i mean i don't care i'm just like whatever whatever Mm-hmm. It'll be fun. God felt funny. Yeah. Cat's funny too. I like Cat a lot. She's on the show with them. Okay. And she's a libertarian and she pushes back and they have a funny banter and I think it'll be a fun a fun time. Nice. Well, I'm excited to see too. it. To Bridget getting trashed on that <laughs> <on> television. <laughs> Uh, or me crying or something. <laughs> I mean, I'm like, I think it'll be fun. And then it's like, God, to. <laughs> you guys are so big. That was the most traumatizing experience. I was thinking about life. like, what if I had just some kind of breakdown and was like, <laughs> Fox News is the enemy of the people. You can always brain, blame pregnancy <laughs> hormones. Like, you guys are part of the reason Americans are so confused. <laughs> Yes, 
spreading this defiance. Nobody knows which way to go. I just don't care. Don't care. Don't care. Don't, don't, care, care, don't, don't care. care. I'm Gen X, man. Don't care. We were just, we were born and bred to da- laugh while the world burns. Here we are now. Entertain us. That's all this is. Tune in next week for another riveting episode that will change your life, help you get out of your own way, and solve all the world's problems. I want to thank our composer, Jared Elias, my co-producer and cousin, Maggie, and all of you out there listening. This has been Walk-In's Welcome with Bridget Fettesy. I'm Bridget Fettesy, and you're welcome. (laughs) (laughs) It's the dumbest line. (laughs)